Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am here yet again with another very exciting conversation episode. So this week, I sat down with the two wonderful women in The Partial Historians, Dr. Rad and Dr. G, and basically I just asked them to give me all the information they could in about an hour on the very real badass Cleopatra the Seventh, the last pharaoh of Egypt and very controversial woman. She was the woman who led Egypt during its encounters with Julius Caesar. You know the one. She might have had a little something with him. And then there was Mark Antony. And ultimately, her story gets lost in the stories of those men. But fortunately, today we have the partial historians to take it back, tell us all everything about Cleopatra, the woman beyond these men, the truth of her that gets lost in pop culture and rumors and theory and nonsense, because ultimately she was a very real queen of ancient Egypt. Conversations, seduction or strategy, the very real Cleopatra VII with the partial historians. Thank you, ladies, so much. I'm here today with the Partial Historians to talk all about Cleopatra, who is one of the first real women I've covered on my podcast, and it seems very appropriate that we go with her. Technically, Cleopatra the Seventh, which I think is often forgotten, is quite how many Cleopatras there were before her, but she is the most famous one. Thank you so much for being with me, and basically, we're here today for you guys to just kind of teach me, and therefore also my listeners, everything you want to about Cleopatra, because I personally don't know half as much as I would like. She is a fascinating case study. We are so excited to be here. That's Dr. Rad. Yeah, yeah, I'm Dr. Rad, by the way, yeah. And you're Dr. G. I'm Dr. G. Those are the two voices, so welcome. (laughs) So Cleopatra, I think, Dr. Rad, I think you should definitely start, because Cleopatra is one of your key women as it were, in your life as a teacher? She is, yes. I'm lucky enough to get to teach a little bit about her. And I must admit that actually, when I first started doing my PhD, it was initially going to be very heavily featuring Cleopatra in film. So I I do have a special Mm. love affair with Cleopatra, but I won't start with the films this time. Let's start (laughs) with the basic biographical details. (laughs) All right, so Cleopatra the Seventh, as you rightly pointed out, is born into a pretty high drama family situation in that the Ptolemies really are like the Kardashians of the ancient world, don't you think, Dr. G? It is a real mess. Like, we don't know who Cleopatra's mother is, asterisk, and we also don't know with her father who his mother is mm. either. It's actually a sense in which he was an illegitimate child who comes into power. And so the whole family is a bit of a mess. And Egyptian court politics seems to be all about maneuvering different groups of people against each other. And Cleopatra is one of five children. Yeah, all of whom seem fairly keen to have power or are just given power at some point, uh, which means that they're in constant rivalry with one another, which, again, is pretty normal for the Ptolemies, you know. <laughs> they like a bit of drama. Yeah, just, just another day at the office, yeah. So... When she is born, we're looking at sort of the mid-first century BCE, I think around 69 is what we're thinking of, Uh, and her father's reign is not always super secure. It is completely unstable. Yeah. Uh, It is is fair to say. He rules for a really brief period of time before he gets chucked out, and then he comes back in again. Yeah. So there is this situation that he finds himself in, um, in the sort of the 50s BCE, where he gets 
uh, overthrown by his eldest daughter, mm. Beri Nike. And so he has to leave Egypt in a bit of a hurry, um, ends up in Rome, and it's like, guys, could you help me get my kingdom back? And they're like, sure. How much are you going to pay us? <laughs> One million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he pays a lot of money to the Romans wow. too. To get it back from his daughter. So his daughter took it from him? His so daughter he's paying all that him. to get it back from his daughter. I yeah. mean, that's great. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. And of course, once he gets it back, I mean, what else would you do to a misbehaving child but execute them? I mean, there's no other way. There is there is no way to deal with that. I mean, what are you going to do? Go to your room? I live in a palace. That's not a punishment. <laughs> get into the desert now and stay there. Yeah. It's from my room that I took the kingdom from you in the first place. Yeah, exactly. do it again. Yeah. Dad, face it, you're just not that cool. Yeah, so Cleopatra would have seen all of this happening. She would have seen the relationship her father develops with Rome, the kind of relationship that it is. She would have seen what happened when her sister tried to take power. We can only guess what kind of impact this would have had on her. It's fair to say, though, that there is a Roman presence in Egypt from the 50s onwards because the army that Ptolemy, and this is Ptolemy the Twelfth, pays for, uh, ends up being garrisoned in Alexandria to make sure that he retains power now that he's mm. paid for these Roman mercenaries, essentially. Um, so there is a Roman presence in Egypt um, during Cleopatra's early life. And some rumors have it that Antony was part of that force. Yeah, so they met when she was a kid. Yeah, Ooh. he sees her off in the distance when she's about 16, apparently, and he's in his like, late 20s. Um, and... That might be a bit of a foreshadowing. Spark. Spark, spark, spark. <laughs> <laughs> At least from his side. Yeah. I mean, 16 is, I guess, not as young as she could be for that world. I was kind of reassured by hearing 16. <laughs> but you said child. This is true. This is That's very awful. true. That's awful. It's awful to be reassured, but like comparatively. No, we, we, we all deal with ancient world subjects. We know how bad it could have been. <laughs> Yeah, so essentially what ends up happening for Cleopatra is that when she's around the age of 18, her father dies and he leaves control of Egypt to herself, but also one of her younger brothers, Ptolemy the 13th. An unlucky number. <laughs> so it would turn out. <laughs> yeah, and uh, very quickly things aren't going smoothly between the two of them. I mean, obviously they've got the whole brother-sister dynamic going on, you know, the kind of husband-wife, brother-sister vibe so common to Egypt, you know, the Ptolemies. Have, Lovely. Yeah, exactly. They've they've picked that right off, right off where the Egyptians <laughs> left off. Um, but yeah, but they do not get along, uh, seemingly because Ptolemy the 13th is surrounded by court advisors that are anti-Cleopatra. He's actually very young as well. Yeah. So we're talking about, what, 10, 11? I actually thought he was about 13, but still Maybe very 13. young. Yeah, yeah, still very young. Quite yeah. young. And so he doesn't, he's not fully a ruler yet. He definitely has a regent and he has a whole bunch of court surrounding him as well. I mean, they both do, but she's slightly older, um, a little bit more mature, perhaps. Um, but it seems that Ptolemy the 13th is really open to the persuasion of his cabinet, which makes sense. He's a bit of a kid. Yeah. Um, but it is a problem for Cleopatra, but it's also a problem for Rome because one of the things that their father does with his will is he says that he wants Cleopatra and Ptolemy the 13th to rule jointly and that the executors of his will in this case are to be the Roman people. Which means he basically gives Rome the option to come into Egypt at any time after his death to sort out a situation if they need to. That seems ominous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely where, that's definitely where we're going to insert this sound, yeah. this sound effect. Dun dun dun. Yeah, yeah. It's like I think you've just asked for some horrible thing to happen with that. Yeah, it does open the pathway for Rome to um, feel that they are legitimately going into Egypt whenever they turn up. And as we see throughout Cleopatra's career, they do turn up uh, mm. in a number of different ways. Yeah. There's some famous instances, I would say, yeah. Yeah. Even, yes. th even those I know. <laughs> yeah, and it happens fairly quickly because, as luck would have it, Rome is also engaged in a civil war around this time. Caesar and Pompey squaring off against each other. Caesar beats Pompey. Pompey runs away to Egypt 
presumably where he's anticipating to regroup because he's had this relationship with Ptolemy the Twelfth, Cleopatra's father, in that he was one of the people that helped to shore up his reign when things were looking incredibly shaky. Uh, but unfortunately for him, when he turns up with his little entourage, which includes his family, as he's walking towards the shore, he is famously decapitated. And it would seem that they did this because they were thinking that Caesar, well, Caesar won the Civil War, therefore we want to please Caesar, not this loser. Famously decapitated is a great phrase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, his head ends up in a jar. Yeah. Caesar cries oh over my God. it. You know, you oh, my God. Yeah. That's famous. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. The classic head in a jar situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Caesar then adding extra salted water to that pool when he gets it and is like, oh, pumpy, pumpy. <laughs> Little tears falling into the jar. <laughs> it was not his time. Not his time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So Egypt's in this weird situation because Cleopatra and Ptolemy the 13th have not got it along and they're bickering about power at the same time that that civil war that has broken out in Rome so there's both a civil war in Egypt and a civil war with Rome and so Pompey turns up to an Egypt where he's not expecting it to be so out of control Mm. as it is yeah he thinks it's a little bit more stable than the Roman situation he doesn't realize until he gets there and it's far too late and he has no head left yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, and Cleopatra at that stage has run off because Ptolemy the Thirteenth has really uh, started to dominate. Um, his faction has risen to the top, and she's basically had to flee uh, and to regroup with forces so that she can come back. And now we set the scene for, of course, one of the most famous moments of Cleopatra's life, which is when Caesar rocks up, establishes himself in the Palace of Alexandria, and he's hanging out there, recovering from the shock of finding Pompey's head in a jar. <laughs> When Cleopatra decides now is the moment to try and, you know, put her case to the Romans and do what her father did, I guess, and get reinstated, you know, with the, with the backing of the Romans. And so she famously has herself smuggled into the palace in some form of cloth, either a rug or a pile of laundry. Some kind of bag, a giant bag. Yeah. Filled with clothes. <laughs> yeah. And then brought into Caesar's room where she's like, ta-da! He's like, excuse me? You may be impressed. (laughs) (laughs) It's a problem for Caesar, though, because by the time she turns up in Alexandria and Caesar is in Alexandria as well, the situation with the Egyptian civil war has also taken another turn Mm. because it's not just uh, Ptolemy the 13th sort of going for sole rule. It's also his other sister, Asinoe, who has also built a rival faction in Alexandria and is now threatening to steal his troops from underneath him um, by persuading the leader of them to come over to her side. Yes, yeah, so not there's no civil war like a three-way civil war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty tense. You've got Ptolemy the Thirteenth, Cleopatra and Caesar all holed up in the palace in Alexandria. And you've got Asinoe having snuck out of the palace and made her way to armed forces. Yeah, and she's basically holding the rest of the city outside the palace area of Alexandria. Uh, and this leads into what is known as the Alexandrian War. So it takes about a year. Caesar almost dies on a couple of occasions uh, while he tries to figure out how he's going to sort this situation. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) And in this time, at some point, we are fairly certain that Caesar and Cleopatra get down to business. (laughs) Another great sound effect. I mean, if you get smuggled into his room in some sort of cloth, I feel like, you know, something's bound to happen. It it is sending a message, I suppose. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What can I offer you, Caesar? Interested at the least. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I mean, this is the thing. You don't want to reduce Cleopatra to these sorts of moments, but it would it would make sense, according to ancient world standards, I think, for them to have struck a political deal and then to have kind of solidified that by forming a sort of personal relationship on top of that. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty standard in the ancient world, and the Romans are very used to it, and the Egyptians are very used to it, whereas a liaison is a political engagement. And Cleopatra doesn't do things any differently from anybody else in this respect. Um, She tries to shore up the deal. Um, She's luckily in the palace, so she has access to Caesar. 
and it seems that it goes well and a child is produced mm. um, and that seems and they do seem to get along they go on this trip along the Nile or after, do they or do they yeah. after the Alexandrian war not while the war is happening no. but apparently post war yeah or do they yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, at some point, definitely a child is conceived and it it seems fairly certain that Caesar is a father. And and this is significant because famously, Julius, I keep saying that famously, famously, Julius Caesar was not able to have a male heir with any of his legitimate Roman wives. Doesn't have the gear. No. Yeah. Mm. It's all Cleopatra. All, she's clearly she knows what, what yeah, she's doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's clearly a strategy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like she's just very strategic in general. Like, I, I mean, of course, so many of these things have turned into f- sort of poor ideals of her or portrayals of her, as if she's some sort of you know seductor. But it seems to me it's more about strategic and knowing how to get the power you want versus you know. I mean, it's. There's no harm, I think, in that world in taking advantage of the fact that you're a woman, so you hold less power or different power, so like use what. Yeah, you've and got. I, I think, yeah, I think there is a, a mutual wheeling and dealing happening between Caesar and Cleopatra uh, that is often overlooked in popular imaginings of this these sorts of moments. Caesar also could really use the backing of Egypt because Egypt, of course, is a potentially very wealthy area. You know, when things are going well, lots of grain you know, other precious resources, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good country to have on your side, especially if you've just fought a civil war. Yeah. And it's the sort of thing as well, where, I mean, it's this kind of thing where we maybe credit too much from hindsight, but there's no way that Cleopatra could anticipate that the child that she would have with Caesar would be a boy, which would be useful. I, nobody gets to really choose those sorts of things. I mean, that's convenient, <laughs> uh, but the political alliance would probably stand anyway because of the strategic usefulness of Egypt being mm. the breadbasket, as it comes to be known um, later on. But it's she also goes to Rome, so she does. She doesn't stay in Egypt even once the deal has been secured, ostensibly. She does follow Julius Caesar back to Rome, and she does spend a couple of years in Rome rather than in Egypt. Mm. So that seems like a risky move considering the kind of court politics that we know takes place in Egypt. So she must have been pretty certain by the time she makes that decision that she's really got no rivals left. Well, she's got, she had a couple of years um, after, after the Alexandrian War. She does have a little bit of time in Egypt to sort of solidify things while Caesar's off, you know, fighting other campaigns and that kind of thing. And he's making his own way home. And he has, of course, captured her sister Arsinoe. Uh, so she's out of the way. And he's instated her in power with her other younger brother who's even younger than Ptolemy the 13th Ptolemy the 14th who <laughs> mysteriously disappears from the records uh, not long afterwards so I think she is feeling fairly secure because she's basically got no free siblings left because Ptolemy the 13th dies during the Alexandrian war drowned in his own heavy armor Ooh, great end yeah, yeah great end so yeah all, all her siblings eventually are either imprisoned or dead or missing <laughs> yes. in mysterious circumstances. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like maybe Cleopatra knows where they are. I think she might. I think she might too. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, going to Rome, uh, obviously, and, and it is obviously so connected with Caesar because he even apparently put up a, a statue of her in the temple mm. of Venus um, Genetrix, which is obviously a big, big thing from Caesar because he – claims to be descended from venus and that's the temple that he built to solidify his claim to having a relationship with venus so to place cleopatra in there and that does ruffle some feathers cicero famously hates her (laughs) Mm. and is very open about saying so yeah and i think i think this is really where we start to get the mythologization of cleopatra happening because she arouses strong feelings in the Romans from the start. Once she gets involved in their story, and they are, of course, writing history in the form that we we look at history these days, you know, narratives, biographies, those kinds of things. They're writing those kinds of sources, which the Egyptians aren't really producing at this point in time. So they kind of get to dictate the terms on which we see Cleopatra and how we meet her. 
And so I think it's during these sorts of moments, her interactions with Caesar and the, the nature of them and how they arouse. For some people, obviously, they might be into it. Definitely, I think she started a bit of an Egyptian fashion craze amongst <laughs> Roman women. But other people not into it. Definitely not happy. She does seem to be a polarizing figure. And it's it seems partly some of our source materials suggest that it's not so much that she's like uber attractive, because that's one of the things that that sort of crops up as this kind of like misconception of Cleopatra. But one source in particular, and I can't remember off the top of my head who, but maybe you will as I tell you about it. Plutarch. Um, talks about her voice. Plutarch, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the way that when she starts to speak, it's almost as if she's just so captivating to mm. listen to. And she has such a command of her expression that she comes into a conversation and immediately changes the whole focus of it just by being there. And that's just kind of like an X factor. That's just a person with massive amounts of charisma. And there's not much you can do about that. You're either going to like her or you're going to find her effect on you to be like deeply troubling. Mm -hmm. And how do you respond to that? Yeah, it tends to be there's no like in the middle for that kind of yeah. that kind of rea- or type of person. Yeah, absolutely. And she also seems to be very intelligent. Plutarch also tells us that she speaks several languages, although interestingly, Latin is not one of them. Hmm. So presumably, yeah, presumably <laughs> it must have been Greek that they were chatting each other up in. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately for Cleopatra. And Caesar, let's face it, he gets stabbed to death <laughs> rather violently. <laughs> that old thing. It's a bit awkward. Yeah, yeah. she yeah. does leave Rome at that point. She's like, you know what? Bad time for me to be here, <laughs> heading back to Egypt. Super awkward, guys, but I just got a phone call. Egypt needs me back again. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with the man you just killed. Absolutely nothing to do with him. I would have left anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was bored of you guys, <laughs> let's face it. These parties are not cool. <laughs> Yeah, so she goes back to Egypt and she's she's there for a couple of years just, you know, doing her own thing. And unfortunately, because she because of what she's doing isn't directly super concerning to the Romans, we don't get a lot of information about what she's up to at this point in time. You know, it's little bits and pieces, but it's not nowhere near as detailed because she's not having sex with a Roman <laughs> general. So Yeah. 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 So we've got like a sort of about a three year period where we're not really sure what she's up to. Uh, And because, again, those Egyptian sources are not dealing with narratives in the same way that Roman and Greek sources are, we just sort of don't get too much of a of a picture. But she does turn up again in about 441 uh, BCE and she's in the east at that stage. And this is where she famously re-meets Antony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And Antony, of course, is busy dealing with the aftermath of Caesar's assassination. So there's, again, division within Rome itself. You've got Brutus and Cassius and their crew, you know, have been on the loose, whereas Antony and Octavian have been trying to track them down and kill them in revenge for what they did to Caesar. Yeah, and at this point it seems like Octavian and Antony are natural allies of Cleopatra because they're trying to avenge the murder of Caesar. So it's in her interest to sort of check out what's going on um, and try to figure out where she might fit in with that. And they do seem pretty grateful uh, for her offer of assistance. Well, she'd actually been approached by the other side. Mm. And she was, she was quite strategic in the way she handled it. And that <laughs> She's she, like, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> oh, I, no. I, I've totally got some stuff on your way. It's in the mail. Oh, it should be there by now. You know what? Check your tracking number. You know, you, you got to chase that up. Is this yeah. the situation with Dolabella? Because there is yeah. a moment where she's kind of she gets she has to backtrack a lot with everybody because people are expecting her to turn up and she's made some promises to all sides um, as a way of just sort of like keeping the strategy afloat so she can adjust and change it seems as it as things pan out and people are expecting her places and she's not able to be there and she has to talk a lot about how we got caught in a storm you know, the wind changed and we weren't able to leave. And there's elements of truth to all of those kinds of statements. Uh, but there also seems to be elements of strategy about them as well. Being like, definitely, of course, I'll, I'll be, I'm so sorry. It just didn't work out. The weather, the weather. <laughs> yeah. Might be a goddess, but I can't control the weather, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but eventually, eventually she does throw her throw her hat in the ring with Antony and Octavian, definitely. Yeah. Antony and Octavian have got this alliance happening and 
Anthony, now that Bruce and Cassius are dealt with, he's thinking that he's going to pick up where Caesar had left off. Just before Caesar was assassinated, he was thinking he was going to go on a campaign against the Great Parthian Empire. So Antony decides that's what he's going to do. And of course, he needs resources in order to do this. And so Cleopatra would be the natural port of call for him. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So in 41 BC, we have another very famous moment, if you are a fan of Cleopatra films, which is the meeting of Cleopatra and Antony at Tarsus. Ah, yes. And this gets lots of traction in films. Um, It's kind of a great moment because she does arrive with what appears to be a pretty fancy barge. Um, she's really kind of like hitting all of the high notes of like, I'm an Egyptian goddess, not just the Pharaoh, not just the queen of Egypt. I am Isis. Yeah. So it's in the flesh. Perfumes, entertainment, (laughs) food, (laughs) the whole, the whole shebang. Yeah. And she, at this stage, she's only about 22. Oh my God. Yeah. It's hard to believe that. I know. She's so young. She knows how to make an entrance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Anthony, Anthony at this stage is about 36 and he just like falls off his horse. Uh, <laughs> like, oh my God, it's that chick that I crushed on years ago in Egypt. <laughs> uh, so she decides to strike a deal with Anthony that she would help him if he <laughs> agrees to kill all her rivals including her sister, who is still out there living in exile. Oh, yeah. So us, in a way, is what hold up in Ephesus, Ephesus, which is quite nearby Tarsus. Mm. She's like, well, since you're here, Anthony, the way you could prove that you really like me, since it seems like you say you do, (laughs) uh, maybe you could help me out with this situation. So that happens, and uh, but unfortunately, Anthony can't start his campaign straight away, which means that he (laughs) has to winter with Cleopatra, and they get to spend a little bit of quality time together. (laughs) Uh, this is like a great moment. So like the winter in Alexandria, apparently Antony treats this like a, a real holiday, a holiday from being Roman by all reports. <laughs> He's like, you know what? I like Greek dress. I'm interested in this food you've got going on, the culture. I'm going to hang out with the philosophers. I'm not going to do politics. Just want to learn and hang out, you know, chill. Yeah. And of course, at this point, we presume they become lovers. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, Antony is actually married. Oh, that is awkward. Yeah. Mm. He's married to one of the most amazing women in Roman history, Fulvia. Doesn't appreciate what he's got at all. No. Unfortunately, Fulvia and his brother Lucius decide that they're going to kick off a civil war with Octavian whilst he's in Alexandria. So he has to leave Cleopatra to go and deal with that whole situation and, and calm everything down because things are looking very tense and very shaky for the Antony Octavian alliance at this point in time. That is becoming increasingly dicey. Yeah. And in 40 BC, they strike the Treaty of Brundusium. And part of that deal where they kind of renew their promises to each other and what they're going to do with each other is that Antony has to marry Octavian's sister, Octavia. Ah, uh, yes. But uh, that's uh, a marriage that has interesting consequences as well, because it's not like he really gives up on Cleopatra during all of this. No. No, it, it does seem to be very much a political marriage. Mm. So is he is he not married to Fulvia anymore, or they're just kind of saying, like, fuck her because she's starting a civil war, so you have to marry a different woman? She actually died okay. not long after. Yeah, so when Antony comes to deal with the whole situation that she and Lucius have caused, he is absolutely furious with her. And she had just been trying to look out for his interests uh, in her own mind. And <laughs> it, it, al- it almost seems as though she dies of a broken heart because mm-hmm. he is so angry with her. Debatable. Pro- probably not, probably <laughs> not. But he- she is absolutely devastated. He is so furious with her. And then she dies. So, Yeah. Mm. It's, it's a bit of a sad ending for yeah. someone who is truly legendary. Yeah, so meanwhile, whilst all this has been happening, of course, Cleopatra has just given birth to twins. She's like, wow, they're Antony's children. Yeah, and they are adorably named Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene. So the sun wow. and the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Super yep. cute. That's yeah. cute and also the a little presumptive. Name. Yeah, look, the kind of naming system only a goddess can get away with. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Like, a little much. (laughs) Yeah, they are the children of Isis. 
Um, so Cleopatra goes about her business, you know, she's got her kids, she's got her kingdom, she's striking some good deals for Egypt. She seems to be doing a pretty good job because I think it's kind of interesting to think, but it seems as though Cleopatra wasn't always actually very popular with her own people, particularly when she very first came to power. And that's probably to do with the legacy of her dad and, you know, all the infighting that had been going on. But the longer she reigns, the more it seems like she's winning people over because she does seem to be making moves to safeguard the prosperity of Egypt, you know, as much as she can. Yeah, and it seems that um, her deals are pretty strategic. And she also gets some credit um, from some of our sources for learning to speak Coptic as well. Um, so she does go out of her way to learn the language of the Egyptian people. Mm. And this means that she's doing something that other Ptolemies haven't bothered to do, mm. um, which puts her in a new category, um, even though it's kind of like desperate times um, for her and for Egypt and for the whole sort of pharaonic structure. She's definitely making a play to set this up for stability. And she's got a few kids in the wings for that now. <laughs> um, and Antony really does agree for his children to take a back seat as well. So he becomes more invested in that over time. And he lets Julius Caesar's child take the top rank um, amongst those children, makes it really clear that his children are second rank uh, within that structure, which is really interesting as well. Very unusual for a Roman man. They don't usually take the backseat. I think <laughs> Antony might have been a special man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's around 37 BC when Antony and Cleopatra come into contact with one another again because Antony is once again thinking about Parthia. Mm. Yeah. So he and Octavia leave Rome, setting out get to get ready for the campaign. Octavia, however, is pregnant and doesn't feel particularly well, and so she gets sent home. She doesn't get to go all the way to Egypt, which is perfect timing. I bet Antony was like, <laughs> Yes! Freaking love morning sickness! Yes! <laughs> and so when they meet again, Cleopatra does not just fall into his arms. Antony, you come back to me at last! She has some requests for some territory. Damn right. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and of course, Antony's like, yeah, yeah, sure, no problems. She was like, you know, when you get into Parthia, these are some of the chunks that I'd like. Yeah. And he's like, right, you are, miss. Yeah. So they again winter together in 36. Antony is ready to embark on his campaign finally, you know, years in the making. The campaign, unfortunately, is a complete disaster. Cleopatra has to come and totally bail him out. Yeah. Once again, it's solidifying their relationship. I kind of love that he's kind of like just this like lovable doofus. He was like, I'll do it for you. And she was like, yeah, you better. And then he's like half an hour later, Oi, could you bring those extra ships? Because I kind of fucked it up. She's like, sure, honey. Arr. Yeah, so it seems like he retires, probably planning to go and deal with the Parthians again and try and redeem his honor. But unfortunately, there's another situation which has arisen and demands his attention. It so often seems to happen. He has to go and deal with Sextus Pompeius, who's causing all sorts of havoc. Okay, and then... Pause, he, pause. Yeah. Sextus Pompeius is hugely important. Let us not forget. Fair uh, enough. He is the son of Pompey the Great, the guy who got his head cut oh. off and put in a jar. And he's been pissed off at the whole situation with Rome ever since then, essentially. <laughs> so he is very against Caesar because he believes that Caesar is kind of responsible for the whole situation that his dad got into because of that civil war. And then Caesar gets stabbed and then Octavian and Antony are on Caesar's side. And he's like, I'm not having any of that. And he basically builds a rebel force of pirate ships and sails through the Mediterranean causing trouble for everybody <laughs> for years and he's hanging about with all of you sailing ships being like screw you Rome screw you all I want a deal yeah. I want a cut and this if you're is not like, going to give yeah. it to me I'm going to take all the cash <laughs> yeah this is he's like this is what zero fucks looks like for Rome I give zero fucks <laughs> screw you all yeah. uh, and he's often often skipped over but I don't want to skip over him I, I'm no just you're like, right I was, <laughs> I was once again going to be sidetracked by the grand romance of Antony and Cleopatra and totally forget about the pirate captain <laughs> the pirate captain I'm very glad I heard about the pirate <laughs> <laughs> but he has been causing trouble um, and they do have to deal with him and at some point they decide that they actually need all of their forces combined in order to deal with Sextus Pompeius because he has just caused so much trouble
one way or another, Antony ends up back in Alexandria after dealing with Sextus Pompey <laughs> and all the pirate ships. <laughs> yeah, and all and all the pirate ships and all that kind of stuff. And it's around um, it's around 34 BC that we get a very big moment, which really I think is a turning point for this whole story, and that is the donations of Alexandria. Ooh. Yeah. So it's where Antony and Cleopatra put on this huge show it's the party to end all parties yeah it's this huge all this pageantry and antony kind of just divides up all these territory and bestows it on cleopatra and all the children mm. now i should point out this is not land that he actually has any right to give anyone <laughs> doesn't really own any of it no, no he is not master of the universe and these places actually have rulers already doesn't details really matter. Details. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't worry about that. We'll figure out the fine print later. <laughs> um, the important thing is that you're going to have them. <laughs> yeah. So it's definitely you can definitely see this sort of structured thing with Cleopatra and Antony at the top, and then you've got Caesarian, and then you've got Antony and Cleopatra's children underneath that, all having their own little realms in this like monster dynasty that they seem to be creating. Yeah. And so this is where the moment comes where uh, Cleopatra is heralded as the queen of Kings. Um, and the, yeah. And the new Isis like reborn. It's like, she's fully come into her own and it's this sort of grand gesture. I think of just how much he might be like completely in love with her by this point. That seems like, I mean, from a political standpoint, this is crazy. This is bonkers stuff for him to be doing. So you have to think at some point that maybe he's turned from like being politically strategic to just being, I'm all in. Yeah. I think up to this point, he could definitely justify his relationship with Cleopatra. Like when, when his Roman buddies were like, Hey, dude, like, what's up with you and Cleopatra? Like, what, Octavia's not good enough for you? You don't like Rome anymore? And he'd be like, guys, guys, I've got this whole under control. I'm just using this chick so I can get some resources for Parthia. You know what I'm saying? Egypt is really strategic, and if I have their backing, we'll definitely be able to take the East. Yeah, it's all about the grain, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but no, at this point, at this point, it's pretty clear um, that... Uh, Things have shifted for him. Yeah. And the Romans are all over this. And Octavian in particular is kind of like, that's it. Yeah. I'm done with this. Yeah. This guy has lost it. He is an embarrassment to Rome and we just cannot have this continue. And of course, this is also, I, I admit, an insult to his sister who has born Antony children by this stage as well. And they are still married. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, because there's like the third, they have a third child at some point as well. Antony and Cleopatra have a third child, but <laughs> Antony and, and Octavia have two children together. The man is busy. <laughs> He's doing a lot of business. Yeah. yeah. Stretching himself thin. But also it's like, so that's a lot of traveling between Rome and Egypt. Like, I mean, the Mediterranean is pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, lot of seed to spread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to be on the ground to do the business. Yeah. No. Not like modern days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this is definitely the moment when again things start to shift i think for cleopatra in terms of the way that rome wants to deal with her so now she's really quite scary and threatening because a man at the top of his game you know uh, he's got a reputation as a good general you know he's got the connection to caesar he's really ruling ruling the roman world alongside octavian and yet he is willing to make these sorts of crazy political moves for Cleopatra. And this is where we start to get the kind of attraction, but also I think really crippling terror at the power that Cleopatra must have over someone like Antony. You know, the, the seduction, the potential for seduction that she has. Yeah, and this kind of calls into relief all of the people in Rome that already knew her from her previous encounters and the time that she spent there. And if they didn't take to her then, they've really turned on her by this point. And this is a really strategic play for Octavian at this point as well because he can reclassify the situation as an external war from Rome's perspective. They have to take out Cleopatra. She is the danger. Rather than making it a civil situation where going after Antony is just a perpetuation of the civil unrest that Rome has been experiencing for years now, um, they can turn it into what they like to call a just war and be like, well, she just needs to go. So you've got, you've got a lot of mythologizing of Cleopatra that's going on 
all throughout this time. Obviously, the moment she's become queen, she's producing her own propaganda, you know, some target, mostly targeted obviously towards like her Egyptian subjects and that sort of thing, but she is putting out her own image and creating her own image there. But then the more that she's entwined with Antony, the more that they start creating their own propaganda of them as a couple. So, you know, coinage with them both featured on it together. And again, notoriously, Cleopatra really does not look great on these coins. Uh, so it's an interesting kind of propaganda. But yeah, they're, they're producing their own kind of propaganda. And then you've also got Octavian, who's coming after her because she can now be the target. Um, he, she can be the bat that he's going to use to beat Antony to death. And so he really drums up the fact that this is a foreigner. This is a woman in political power. This is against everything Rome stands for. Yeah, it kind of hits all of those notes that Romans are perpetually afraid of. Um, foreigners and women. I mean, that's <laughs> basically it. Rome yeah. cannot handle the, either of those things. Particularly if they have power. Both so horrifying. Horrifying. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, how did Ugh. it even happen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and because Antony really is like, I'm all in. <laughs> and everyone's like, wow, you really emasculated yourself, bro. <laughs> Um, that's kind of like the Roman take on everything. As soon as a woman is involved in a powerful sense, um, they they just kind of turn into that sort of like misogynistic kind of phraseology. And part of our issue um, when thinking about Cleopatra and the way that she's portrayed in the source material is that Octavian ends up winning this war mm. and all of the sources then uh, written from that point onwards come with his kind of sort of approval tacitly you want to keep that guy mm-hmm. happy and that then be really cements cleopatra in this negative light as this seductress and this person who cannot be controlled and she's able to turn men against their own country you know and the idea that uh antony's masculinity has been completely stripped away in his willingness to do anything that she asks as far as the romans are concerned this is like the worst thing that could possibly happen to a guy and and so cleopatra has to be the one to blame it's always the woman's fault if we know anything from my podcast is it's always the woman's fault absolutely and and this would be this is always <laughs> be interesting for you because obviously i'm sure the need is something that's attracted your attention you know <laughs> quite a bit but a reminder to my listeners who have listened to my 12 part over a whole year covering of the Aeneid um Octavian is Augustus so that's Octavian is his name before he takes the role of emperor and then he is Augustus so every time uh we're talking about Octavian here that is the same man that I have complained about in the Aeneid (laughs) yeah exactly and the the Aeneid could really be seen to be telling this kind of a story because it's all about you know, this Trojan prince mm-hmm. who falls into a passionate love affair with an African queen. Yeah, the difference being that unlike Antony, he does his duty. He does what he's supposed to do. He leaves her. He leaves her and is like, <laughs> whatever, dude, throw yourself onto a pie. I see if I can. Um, <laughs> Why won't you talk to me? Yeah. I came all the way to the underworld. Poor Dido. Yeah. So that it, all this propaganda that's coming out uh, you mm-hmm. know, during and after Cleopatra's, um, you know, final sh- like showdown and, and during a- Augustus's reign, it, it is very clearly sending this message that Antony did not do the proper masculine Roman thing. Yeah, and we see this coming through in a lot of the sources that are close to this period in time. So one of the ones that I looked at in the lead up to this chat today was Horace's Odes, Book One. 37 which is looking at cleopatra and it's just it's all negative um he really throws her to the dogs in that poem he was like this is a great victory now it's time to drink we've gone down there we've conquered everything the witch is dead it's all this kind of like all the negativity all bound up in one single poem you're just like wow rome really thanks a lot lovely place yeah and i think i think this is important it's important moment to note as well that when you look at the things that happened up until Actium, you can see how Cleopatra probably wasn't super concerned about siding with Antony over Octavian. Uh, I mean, Antony was really the one who presented himself to her as the opportunity, so I'm not saying that she actually had a choice, and she's like, I'll take this one. But <laughs> Antony doesn't seem like a stupid choice because he does have a political career behind him that's, you know, 
relatively solid. I mean, like, he's not the most amazing person you've ever met, but it's relatively he solid. He has the more solid military reputation, yeah. for sure. Out of the two of mm-hmm. them, he's the safer bet. He's the one that's campaigned for a long time with Caesar. He has that sort of the older elder statesman quality about him. Octavian is an Which real, matters in Rome, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Octavian is a real upstart, yeah. and nobody knows anything about him, really. He's 19 when... Uh, Caesar is murdered. So he's so younger really, than Cleopatra. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. an unknown qu- mm. quantity, really. And so for her to pick Antony is really reasonable. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as you say, it's not until we get into the Battle of Actium in 31 where things take a really disastrous turn that it becomes clear that maybe Antony doesn't have this. Uh, in the bag in the way that she thought he might have no and there's, there's a huge amount of debate about exactly what happened during that battle because cleopatra leaves during the battle i mean antony's roman supporters weren't really happy at her being there at all and her being involved in the planning of this final campaign but she puts her foot down as like guys i'm putting up the money i'm staying but she leaves part way through the battle mm. and antony follows her and there's, this is still one of those, I think, difficult to figure out. Yeah, because we're in the realm of sort of like naval tactics at this point. Yeah. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be always difficult for us to know what was happening there. Because it seems like um, these things can change pretty quickly at sea. Mm. And also, if you're on a ship as part of the battle, your ability to read what is happening in that battle is pretty limited. Mm-hmm. And it seems like... For whatever reason, she's decided that it's it's a prudent idea to pull out. And at that point, Antony has also has seen her leave and has been like, okay, we need to pull out as well. It's not clear whether they were going to lose the battle and that was a good strategic move for them or whether they left too soon and that ended up ensuring the loss. Yeah. That's not clear. Yeah. But certainly once that happens, Antony has effectively lost all credibility in his Roman supporters' eyes. Yeah, and there were a whole bunch of senators that did come down to Egypt um, and came to Antony prior to this, and they're like, we're, we're with you. Uh, we think Octavian's gone too far. Um, he's not behaving in a Roman way. He's setting things up in a way that we think is dangerous. And he Antony leans into that, but it, Actium doesn't go well. And that defeat is kind of crucial for everything from that point onwards. Yeah. And so Antony and Cleopatra do have some time left to spend together and they, they make, make love. Yeah, they, they do they do make the most of it. They <laughs> they have a lot of parties, you know, they enjoy their time remaining to them. I can only think, although there's no evidence about this, that Cleopatra, knowing full well what Octavian would want to do with her once he comes, you know, he'd want to put her in a triumph, just like Caesar had done with her sister Arsinoe. I, I can only imagine that Cleopatra was already prepared not to go down that path. Yeah, um, we're not really, again, we can't be sure. That's yeah, one of those yeah. things that we can't really be sure about no. because this leads into one of those mm-hmm. great uh, sort of mythological moments about Cleopatra as well, mm-hmm. which is the death by snake bite, yeah. which absolutely cannot be verified. No. Um, <laughs> we know that there are snakes in Egypt. That's <laughs> true. Um, how long it would take you to die and how that death would happen and how prepared you'd have to be to make that work is another thing. Um we're just not sure. No, no. And and Antony gets, he goes first. Um, so he commits mm-hmm. suicide um, when it seems like this is going to go Octavian's way. And Cleopatra holds out. And it seems like maybe she thinks that there might be some options for negotiation here. And it's worth finding out what they are. And when it becomes clear that that's not the case, she also commits suicide. Yeah, I think she was prepared mm-hmm. for that. I, I think she always had that as like an option. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we get some interesting sort of like uh, stories around this that, um, and some of which are sort of put into later films as well, where uh, the Romans try to negotiate with her through a door. Um, she's locked in a pretty secure chamber, uh, and while she is discussing it with somebody through the door, one of the other Romans comes around the back way um, and sneaks in, stuff like that. Mm. Those kinds of stories happen. And so you're like, mm. okay, well, her chances of setting up the snake situation that's all a bit tenuous (laughs) seems like would be a lot of work for something that she could have done in a much less difficult and troubling way yeah yeah and the other thing that she could have done 
um, which would have involved snakes, is drinking the venom, mm. which would have been mm. potentially a lot mm. easier. That's scary. It's horrifying. Yeah. It's all horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than encouraging the snake to bite you. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but Octavian, of course, wins the day. She commits suicide and is the last pharaoh to rule Egypt because Octavian makes Egypt his special personal playground, which it shall remain for pretty much all of the Julio Claudians. <laughs> yeah, he decides to make it a annexed province of Rome and puts it under his personal control. Um, doesn't institute any uh, king to sit in there. Gets rid of all the children. Yes. Well, well, well. The, the, the children with... The children that Cleopatra and Antony had, those second-tier children, I bet they're feeling pretty happy that they were second-tier now. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, because they they aren't killed. They're taken they're, back to Rome. They're taken back to Rome, and they're actually raised by Octavia. Oh, whoa! <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. Oh, and, and they're and they're subsequently married off into various the things that woman does for Antony. He does not appreciate yes. Octavia. <laughs> yeah, they, they become they become like royals in other parts of the world eventually you know when they're old enough but the one that he's really concerned about of course is caesarian caesarian Mm -hmm. does not escape with his life caesarian represents a threat to everything that octavian has now built about his own reputation um as being the heir to caesar so that kid's gotta go yeah absolutely yeah yeah and so octavian gets to kind of cement his version of things and the accounts that we have that we have we have the poetry as you mentioned from you know Virgil, Propertius, Horace. You know we've got all of that coming out of Augustus's own reign and lifetime. But then we've also got people like Plutarch and Appian who are writing later, and we've got bits and pieces about Antony and Cleopatra's affair in particular. Caesar it does come up, but it's definitely more Antony and Cleopatra that get the the most attention. You got a little bit on her in, in sources like Suetonius as well, and the biographies he writes of Julius Caesar, and and these sorts of source materials are inspire artworks they inspire plays by shakespeare and they become the the base for a lot of 19th century work about cleopatra and then eventually films about cleopatra and so when we get into the 20th century and the 21st century the cleopatra that we see tends to be the other the (laughs) foreigner the woman you know we, we really focus on those qualities the seductress all those things that were elements of the propaganda that Octavian crafted are really what we tend to see in our popular culture of Cleopatra. When there is actually a rival source tradition that comes out of the Arabic world, it, it is a bit, it is problematic in its own sense in that it comes much, much later. What, I mean, what we have surviving anyway, but it has some really fascinating details and it tends to focus less on her appearance and her relationships with men. It focuses much more on what she actually did in her lifetime. Um, so public works for her kingdom, uh, things that she wrote, works of mm-hmm. science and, and medicine and, and also beauty. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting that there is such a different tradition out there and yet it really hasn't made much impact so far in the popular culture and the way that we represent Cleopatra these and days. And even the sources that we have that are more contemporaneous from when she's alive don't yeah. get as much traction. So we do have a text called the Alexandrian War, which we don't know the author of, but it tends to be connected with Caesar in his writings. And it goes into details which are political and we're looking at the way that she's manoeuvring and it just doesn't tend to get that much airtime. The thing that has happened is that we get we hit Shakespeare, and Shakespeare seems to have really enjoyed Plutarch, hmm. um, and that's that's one of his key sources. And so everything from that point takes that sort of second century Greek uh, moralistic biography tradition and really runs with it. And once we're into that sort of thinking about it in terms of morality and the framing of things as character flaws rather than just like things that are happening in people's lives, then we start to see that Shakespeare really plays off that and it it becomes its own sort of beast when it gets into film and also opera. Mm. And then, of course, with popular culture, that is blended with whatever's happening at the Mm -hmm. time. (laughs) Yeah, and I think it would be, yeah, we wouldn't want to overlook, like, the way in which Cleopatra has an ambiguity about her ethnicity, Mm -hmm. which has really meant that she accrues a lot of popularity from different sections of society who want a piece of her. And the fairest way to put it is that we just don't know. So she has that flexibility 
um, in ambiguity because we don't know who her mother is for sure. We also don't know who her father's mother was. So there's enough ambiguity in the lineage that she sort of can be taken as a Macedonian Greek. She can be claimed as an Egyptian. She can be claimed as an African. And she has this sort of plurality about her. Because we don't know, she has this sort of fascination, I think, when we're thinking about women who are powerful and how they get there and what they do with that power when they have it. And I think there's something to be said as well for our cultures. We we tend to be drawn back to stories where women failing in this sort of tragic, romantic way is a very appealing story Mm -hmm. to us. If If we look at the tradition of biopics, um, as as a genre throughout the 20th century when film becomes a medium. Stories about women with power tend to be stories about women who fail, who try and have it all or, you know, whatever, or they have a – there's well, something that interferes yeah. with their the career. The myth of being able to have it all. Like yeah. that's, the, that's the setup for the failure, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and, and even with royalty, it's always like a choice between do I do my duty <laughs> or do I give give myself over to my heart? And we we tend to like those sorts of stories, and Cleopatra fits really nicely into that kind of a storytelling tradition. Even though it seems that, like, when you look at it, she's really just making strategic decision after yeah. strategic decision. Totally. And, and it's really perhaps the men around her who are maybe not making as strategic decisions as they could, and it works out in her favor. And I think that's interesting as well, because I don't think her story is a narrative of failure. Obviously, it's tragic that she is the last pharaoh of Egypt, but that's kind of not her fault. Yeah. I don't see that as any, you know, you can't hold her responsible for that. No, she seems to have been, I mean, certainly doing her best to not be the last pharaoh of Egypt, but also just, yeah, the level of strategy and power and just intelligence that she brought to everything this has been the most fascinating thing I've ever sat through but also (laughs) like I mean there's just so little in the focus on her when it comes to the things she accomplished beyond the men she slept with and what happened afterwards yeah and when you when you look at what we've actually got documented evidence for Cleopatra only slept with two men in her entire life and she died when she was about our age wow (laughs) Yeah. And so, I mean, it's not to say that she, you know, she was a queen. It's not to say that she didn't have other lovers. But in terms of what we can actually document, this idea of her as some great seductress, she had two, you two know, dudes. pretty solid long term relationships with two men. They just happen to be some of the most famous Roman men to ever have lived. It's just a coincidence. And just, just like they happen to sleep with one of the most famous Egyptian queens to ever have lived. It's just one of those things. Well, and it's political strategy, right? It's not like, yeah, yeah you know, it's all about keeping yourself alive and in power. And No, but it is. And it is, it is a fascination and what, and what she can offer in a visual medium, I think, as well. Like the, one of the earliest silent films to be made about Cleopatra starred an actress called Theda Bara. And Theda Bara was a studio-made confection she she's literally where we get the term vamp from Ooh. okay because she 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 played she she was kind of typecast as these as these characters who were women whose seduction powers were so great that they would literally suck the life force <laughs> from men that's what a vamp is it's short for vampire uh, and, and it's because she played those sorts of roles that they thought she'd be perfect to play the role of cleopatra her name was meant to be an anagram of arab death and there were all sorts of studio. Like she was, she was just a, she was just a Jewish girl from like the Midwest, and they created this whole story about how she was born in the eyes of the Sphinx, suckled on the milk of. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, but they created this, this very, you know, this very dangerous, sexually appealing studio star, and then she was the one they wanted to play, Cleopatra. <laughs> and I think this is this feeds into the really problematic way that our sort of like underlying patriarchal narratives tend to shape the storytelling as well because it's kind of in a way dismissing her strategy and her capacity for politics to be able to sort of like chalk her up as like oh well you know she's the one who slept with all the romans you know um because it means that you don't have to deal with the hard reality that she was fighting tooth and nail one for power. She overcame all of her siblings. Um, that was a fight. 
um, of some magnitude. It involved wars. It involved her having to kill all of her siblings and finding ways to do away with siblings afterwards as well. And then holding on tooth and nail for power um, in whatever way seemed reasonable um, with the options that she had in front of her at the time. Yeah, and I think the other thing is as well, there have been, I think, attempts to maybe try and shift that a little bit like the 1963 Cleopatra. I actually really like that. I know I know it's got a bad rap and I know that not, not everybody thinks Elizabeth Taylor is a great Cleopatra. I actually love it. And I think it's because initially – that was actually, I mean, coming in the 60s, it's obviously, you know, women are starting to get a bit more freedom. You know, it's, it's on the, on the verge of second wave feminism. Um, and originally it was meant to be two films, Caesar and Cleopatra and Antony and Cleopatra. And there was going to be a lot more room to show Cleopatra off in, in that format. She was meant to come across as a political visionary. They really wanted to, open that side of her up. I think you can still see remnants of that, like when she has moments with Caesar where they really are envisioning this world that they're going to rule over together. But unfortunately, it, it was such a mess. The film, yeah. the, the script wasn't finished when they started filming. It was, you know, there was all sorts of drama, obviously, with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor getting together in real life. And the their relationship was exceptionally violent. You know, there were times when they had to take time out of filming because Elizabeth Taylor had been injured in domestic violence incidents. Uh, She'd already almost died anyway and had had a tracheotomy when they were back when they were filming in England. Uh, There was all this drama going on. um, And of course, Burton and Taylor were both married. So there was other spouses to deal with. So all of that kind of ended up taking over a little bit and it ended up costing a huge amount of money. It cost about $44 million in in that time, wow. of which Elizabeth, yeah, of which Elizabeth Taylor got about half for her salary and her living expenses <laughs> while she was there, um, and so it was the most astronomical film. And the expense meant that it really couldn't earn back what you know it it, it kind of did okay, but it could never earn a, a massive profit because it just cost so much to make. And they ended up just sort of chopping it into one film, and a lot of Anthony's story and a lot of Cleopatra's story ended up therefore on the cutting room floor because it was like nine hours, and they they had to cut it down to like two and a half. So yeah. that's really interesting. I haven't actually seen it, and I probably should. <gasps> it's yeah. great. Oh, you should see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Would recommend, but also like have snacks because it's like even now it's about <laughs> okay. four hours long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've 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 re- they've restored it. They've restored it. So yeah, but there is a fantastic scene which is my absolute favorite. I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> G, I am going to reenact it. <laughs> when when Cleopatra uh, and Antony have been apart from some time and he's run off and married Octavia, they show this as being you know devastating for Cleopatra. Which look, who knows? It might have been. You never know. But when he comes back to ask for her help again. She is standing there, you know, she's, well, she's sitting there, you know, all her Egyptian pharaonic regalia looking amazing. Cause I don't care what anyone says, Elizabeth Taylor is gorgeous. And he makes his request and she says, you will kneel. I will what? <laughs> On your knees. You dare ask a representative of the Roman Empire to kneel before you? I asked it of Julius Caesar. I demanded of you. <laughs> ah, so the good. dialogue. It's amazing. You'd probably be better off putting the actual scene in there than me reenacting. But it's just amazing. I love it. <laughs> You've convinced me. <laughs> and of course, we don't know where the Gal Gadot film's going to go. That will be absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It'll be interesting. What, what her future holds, nobody knows. There's so mm. many, so many interpretations of her. I mean, Katy Perry's done her. Beyonce's done her. <laughs> Well, honestly, I mean, I've just been sitting in awe throughout this whole thing. I'm so glad I asked you to do this and that me just saying, give me a rundown on Cleopatra in general produces like a wildly fascinating hour about Cleopatra. So thank you both so much for doing this. This is such a perfect episode for Women's Month, but also just generally dipping into really important historical women, which I so rarely get to do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Always happy to talk Cleopatra. Oh, so glad. Um, so <laughs> why don't we tell everyone where they can listen to your podcast, where you do this about so much more Roman history? Oh, yes. Well, you can find The Partial Historians wherever you listen to excellent podcasts. And we're also on a variety of social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. 
Um, check Although Facebook out. is a little bit problematic. Well, Facebook, yeah, maybe yeah. don't come to our Facebook because we're in Australia and Facebook is uh, trying to do some things with legislation um, in terms of our government at the moment. And uh, we got locked out basically oh of our Facebook gosh, really? for like a week. Um, yeah, because apparently Roman history is still newsworthy um, according to oh. Facebook. So you got called a news organization and that got in trouble? We did. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, I mean, old news is good news. (laughs) This just in from 41 BCE. Antony has met Cleopatra at Tarsus. (laughs) <laughs> he blushes yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're also very excited we've also just started launching some artwork which we're making in collaboration with Bridget Clark uh, which is going to be about some pretty fascinating women from the ancient world probably including Cleopatra at some point mm. so yeah Watch that space. If, you, if you like having some interesting ancient artwork on your walls do come and check it out yes I th- this is recording a couple of weeks before this episode will actually come out but I just reposted your Instagram of that because I saw the Agrippina and that's amazing. That's so exciting that you're doing that. So I'll be posting more of it. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Agrippina is our first uh, our first casualty, but <laughs> Cleopatra, <laughs> Cleopatra is definitely in our sights. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having us as well. Oh, thank you. This has been so wonderful. So everyone, please go subscribe to The Partial Historians and follow them everywhere for more just women podcasting, but women podcasting about badass women in history and mythology. I think we all need more of it. <laughs> yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, nerds, thank you all for listening. As usual, this was such a fun episode to record. I mean, frankly, not so much conversation as just me being like, hey, ladies, can I just have a full history lesson in Cleopatra? And boy, was I not disappointed. I am so excited I had the partial historians on to come and just basically give us a full blown rundown of Cleopatra. I couldn't have been more fascinated and I learned so much. So I hope you all did too. Cleopatra, I think, is a really important and she's also really misunderstood and we can always learn to know a bit more about her. You should make sure you are subscribed to the Partial Historians podcast, follow them on social media. Dr. Rad and Dr. G are doing really great work in podcasting and I highly recommend you check them out. Thank you all again. I hope you're enjoying these wonderful Women's Month episodes. They are such a thrill. And there is more bonus episodes coming up. You are all the best. I am Liv and I love this shit. (laughs) 